The first former president in U.S. history to ever face a criminal trial is now hurtling toward it. It kicks off in just under 72 hours, and Donald Trump is totally calm, cool, and collected. Just kidding. He's absolutely steaming about it. What are you watching as jury selection begins yeah. in New York? Well, you know, jury selection is largely luck. It depends who you get. It's very unfair that I'm having a trial there. It's very unfair that we have this judge who hates Trump and has tremendous conflict, as you know, tremendous conflict. Nobody can believe that this judge isn't recusing himself. He is right about one thing. When it comes to picking a jury, neither side knows who could end up deciding Trump's fate. But as we sit here tonight, three days out from the trial's start, Trump's legal team is asking for changes to how those questions will be asked as they did try to determine which of the jurors can be fair. You just heard Trump blasting Judge Juan Mershon with these baseless accusations again. The judge tonight just denied another attempt by Trump to delay the start of this trial, this time blaming excessive pretrial publicity. With that denial, though, tonight, all systems appear to be a go at the moment for the Monday start. One of the big questions at his news conference earlier that still stands despite the answer that you're about to hear is will Trump himself get on the witness stand? I would testify, absolutely. It's a scam. It's a scam. That's not a trial. No, I'm testifying. I tell the truth. I mean, all I can do is tell the truth. And the truth is that there's no case. They have no case. He has said before that he will testify in other moments, the Mueller investigation, other legal issues that he's faced. We'll see if it actually happens this time, because, of course, the truth now is that Trump faces the real risk of jail time if he says anything to incriminate himself. I'm joined here tonight by a trio of the top legal sources, all veterans of the New York legal scene, Ron Kuby, Renato Stabile, and Arthur Idala, all here. Uh, I kind of, I mean, raise your hand if you think Trump's going to actually take the stand in this. <clears throat> I think there's a good chance Only he does. Only one out of three? He's been, he's been, look, he's been telling everyone that he's going to do it. He's going to have to put his money where his mouth is. And it's the one decision that his lawyers cannot control. If a criminal defendant says he's taking the stand, nobody can stop him. Th that's right. But Donald Trump has made many, many assertions about what he intends to do, what he's going to do, and indeed what he has done, none of which are true. And this kind of momentous decision is a decision that's going to be made at the close of the prosecution's case, not beforehand, and he almost certainly will pass up the opportunity to be cross-examined. So it could be weeks if he does actually take the stand before we see that happen? That would be correct. And I know, and, and so does Ron, his def defense attorney, Susan Necklace, she's a total veteran. She will handcuff him to the table <laughs> before she allows him to take the stand. He took the stand in his last civil case, and the jury crushed him. They gave him 85 Five million dollars uh, a judgment. So, you know, it, he, the proof is in the pudding. He's done it once before and it failed miserably. So shut up and let your lawyers do the work. Okay, so we'll wait to see if it happens. What we do know is it's going to start Monday. That's what it looks like right now. There have been 12, I guess this is now the 13th effort to try to get a, a delay from Monday. It's not working. It hasn't worked. It didn't work, you know, 12 times. Is there anything left that they can still try to do before Monday or is it starting well, Monday? Well, not be heart attack. <laughs> hospitalization, uh, a lawyer suddenly being rushed uh, to the emergency room. I've seen it done. Eclipse. I've never done it. Um, <laughs> but, but short of that, it, the trial is going to be started. Well, but you're going to see number 14 attempt on Monday morning. That's going to be the first thing out of the box because it is going to be an absolute circus outside of that courthouse. And the first thing they're going to say to the judge is, judge, jurors have to walk through this gauntlet. They're going to be prejudiced by this, you know, atmosphere that's going on, and they're going to ask for a delay just based on that Monday morning. And they won't get it? or They won't get it, but they're going to ask. And they're going to ask over and over and over again as things happen throughout this trial. So once this jury selection gets kicked off, I mean, it seems like something that most people probably won't pay attention to, but it's actually a huge part of this trial. It's probably the most important part of the entire trial. Uh, and Judge Mershon is running things in a way that is extremely efficient uh, and will expedite jury selection. For example, every juror uh, is going to be asked whether, at the beginning, whether they can be fair and impartial. And anybody who says they cannot be fair and impartial just raises their hands, and those people are then excused. So if you call 100 jurors and 80 of them can't be fair and impartial, fine. You've got 20 who said that they can. Now, 
the fact that they say they can doesn't mean that, in fact, they can be. But you already will get rid of so many people in advance who either love Trump or hate Trump or, or don't feel that they can sit in the case. Well, and one of the questions that they wanted to ask today was, you know, they wanted to ask that question separately about whether you can be fair. Do you think that's a, a reasonable ask of the Trump legal team? Yes. Um, but just to clarify or just to enlighten people how it usually works, if you if a juror says I can't be fair and impartial, you usually try to rehabilitate them a little bit. Well, why can't you be rehabilitated? And why? And, and tell oh, us why. Oh, you still ask a follow-up question. Yeah, you, and you try to rehabilitate them, especially if it's someone who has a background that looks suitable to your side, whether you're the prosecutor or the defense attorney, and the judge will get involved, and sometimes it works. Here, it just, no, I can't be fair, boom, you're out. And I just spoke to people at the courthouse right before I came on the air. They're going to have about 1,000 people there. So to Ron Kuby's... Perspective Kuby, jurors. Perspective jurors. So to Ron Kuby's point... If 80 of them say, I can't do it, <clears throat> they still have 920 behind <laughs> them to say, okay, well, who can? And um, I think uh, also something you have to look out for is who really wants to be on the trial? In other words, for the wrong reasons. Who wants to be a juror? To write a book, to be sitting next to you when the verdict comes out and there'll be celebrities. So that's another thing that all sides have to look at. A, a thousand people ready to go. I mean, is that... How many jurors normally are waiting for a trial? No. How unusual is that? <laughs> no, oh, it's, it's highly unusual. It's probably the largest number of jurors that have ever been summoned to 100 Center Street. But although this, the process will be efficient in the beginning in terms of people raising their hands and walking out the door, then it's going to get excruciating because he's going to question these jurors orally one by one, and there is a 42-question questionnaire. Now, you would expect in a case like this that you would have a written questionnaire, which would probably more, be more efficient. But some of these questions are, you know, do you belong to the Oath Keepers? Have you ever worked for the Trump Organization? Um, you know, do you subscribe to um, Truth Social? All of those things that people aren't going to be comfortable saying in open court. So I think there's going to be a lot of people raising their hands and saying, can I have a sidebar? Can I go in the back? And that presents all kinds of logistical security concerns. And do they allow that? If you, Of course. If you want to speak privately, the judge is not going to deny something like that. Except but then you have the Secret Service marching up and all kinds of things happen. I mean, the judge has already ruled uh, in this very elaborate ruling that the ordinary process, they simply can't do that because of the number of people who would be at sidebar. All of the attorneys, the prospective juror, the court reporter, the judge, the defendant, and the United States Secret Service, and they just don't have space for that. So it could get complicated, but it, you know, it's not going to be that hard. We have picked juries for people who are less popular in New York than Donald Trump. Yeah, we were just talking with, you know, about Harvey Weinstein and someone like that going on trial. But can I ask you quickly, though, because you know Judge Marchand. Yes. What's it going to be like for him starting on Monday? What should we be expecting? First of all, Judge Marchand is a veteran of the Trump Organization trial. So he knows the players, he knows the people, he knows uh, Susan Necklace, one of the defense attorneys. And he brings a very understated but profound sense of dignity to the proceedings. Uh, he's very much in control. He's not uh, Judge Ngoron, who you know, seems to just want to have a good time. Uh, he was, the one, of course, the one who tried the uh, civil trial. Mm -hmm. And he's not Judge Lou Kaplan in federal court who tried the E. Jean Carroll case, who was just abrasive and bullying and nasty. Uh, Judge Mershon brings dignity, gravitas, and expects it from everyone else. I mean, we just talked about the scene, and I mentioned Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein was at this courthouse. John Gotti was at this courthouse. I mean, this courthouse has seen a lot, and now it's about to see his history. Yeah, and I... I I'm going to throw a bouquet to the people who run that courthouse. The court officers and the clerks, they are fantastic. They really are, and they do it so well, and they practiced. They've been rehearsing who goes where. And one point about if they have to approach the bench, there's a waiver that Donald Trump could sign so that Trump and the Secret Service don't go and approach if a jury wants to speak to the judge and uh, the other uh, parties. When Renato and I worked on the Harvey Weinstein jury selection, it was a written uh, uh, questionnaire where they then made photocopies and both sides got photocopies. And it did go a lot, a lot quicker here. It's going to be all orally. And I mean, yes, they have questions like, who do you listen to in the morning on talk radio? And, yeah. uh, you know, so it'll be. But we all agree that it's not going to be such a long jury selection. Yeah, you uh, you guys were taking bets, not real ones, in the green room of how many days it's going to last. I'm I mean, saying five days at least. I, I go four. And I went with three. Okay, all, all right. right.
Anything else that you're watching The winner for? gets invited back. Yes, exactly. Only the winner. No, we'll have you all back. Look, I mean, the big thing is that the people working on this case, and I'm sure that they have jury consultants working on this case, they're going to be doing deep research on these jurors to make sure that the answers that they're getting in court are truthful answers. And they're not saying one thing just because they want to get on the jury, but their social media says something else, their Twitter says something else. So that's going to be a huge factor in this jury selection. It's going to be fascinating. We'll have you all back. Don't worry, no matter if you're wrong. Uh, maybe if you're not really off on the, the amount of days it takes. Ron Kuby, Renato Stabile, Arthur Idala, thank you all for being here.